points at your camera with the one arm. So we get the common point. Then with your other arm, find the dot where your elbow is and hold on to that spot. So when you remove that arm, you actually got the spot where your elbow is in mid space. Yeah, it takes a bit of coordination. But now we should all be sharing a common spot in the room that we should hold on to. And um, we're kind of all connected by one dot, one pixel, one uh, concept, one idea, one moment in each one of our spaces. And I, and I love the idea that there's this tiny little thing that we're holding here. So I'd like you to explore it a little bit, look at it, examine it closely. My Maybe. pixel is very big. Oh yeah? Oh, good, good. I'm very impressed. Big pixels are better than small ones. Well, yeah, it's actually, you could maybe, you could taste that's it. Called bi that's called bigism. You could, you could taste it, you <laughs> could smell it. You can maybe put it in your hand and, and cradle it a little bit. Maybe oh, it can I smoke it? it? Yeah, can I smoke, smoke my pixel? Here, as long as you move your mouth close to where it is, because that's the whole point, is that it should be in that space. And I'm going to throw mine at you, Fred. Are you going to catch mine for me, please? Fred, I'm throwing it to you. Fred, you ready? Yes, yeah. here we go. Catch. Good one. Now <laughs> you, can, you can choose to throw it to someone else. Uh, Joe. But you have to tell them. Who's got nice. it now? I got it. <clears throat> Joey, watch out. I used to play cricket. <laughs> So this is um, always a great way. Ah, there we go. Someone, I don't know where it's gone now. <laughs> Joe, who did you send it to? <laughs> I think the giraffe caught it. Reginald. Okay. Sorry, <laughs> Mina. Reginald, can giraffes catch balls? <laughs> I do not think that's possible, but my camera went off for a moment. Well, you'll have to but... teach giraffes to catch balls and play cricket. <laughs> oh, that would be difficult. <laughs> <laughs> so while, while we're waiting a few more minutes um, for everyone to arrive, what I'd love to do as a little experiment is um, just to kind of extend our virtual spaces and see and see something in your space. If we can each just point our cameras into an empty corner of the room. There's no empty corner in my place. Uh, up in the ceiling maybe. <laughs> just, just away from you. So we can, I'd love to get a screen grab of all of these empty spaces with our people in them. I think there's just something so magical about having a, 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 a tile of screens where we're seeing other parts of people's spaces. Wow, look at that. I have a star in my space. Yeah, me too. I'll share that one. See, I've also got one there. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody show a star. Ooh, it's getting brighter. That's good. <laughs> That's great. There we go. Fred just turned his star on. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Brilliant. So I think, um, thank you for that. I think that was a nice warm-up exercise just to get everyone to move their cameras around. Um, we're still waiting for a bunch of people to join. Uh, we've hey there, we had Carol. Good, we had a good Hi, Roger. Six, six, How are you? <laughs> okay is the, is the new normal. Mm -hmm. I'm doing well. How are you? Energized. Good. I'm trying to learn from perseverance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we we've given everyone five minutes. To, um, to, to join late. I think whoever still comes in will just step into where we are. I would prefer it if we maybe kick it off because we do have an hour and a half of time we've given ourselves and there's a lot of interesting discussion and presentations that we'd like to see. So if I could maybe um, share for a second the program or the intended program. Uh, we've got um, a brief introduction that's going to happen shortly, and then a series of presentations, um, after which there'll be discussion. As simple as that. And I think I'm going to hand over to Nina to welcome us, um, and we'll take it from there.
Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Nina Tagledi and I'm one of the provocateurs. And uh, I have a question about uh, what are we really learning now in uh, this uncertain times and what are we able to use from what we are learning now? And I would like to thank everybody. I would like to thank the fellow provocateurs. I would like to thank everybody who joined us. And uh, I would like to very much thank Marcus and his team. Thank you. Any of the other provocateurs want to add something to that? Well, I just texted it, so I won't say it. All right, so that maybe gives us a little bit of housekeeping that we can introduce at this point. And that is to say there's a chat function uh, that you can feel to use um, if you want to add something. Um, very often with these sessions, it, it helps to um, capture things there that we can read later or we can share with each other. Um, as part of that housekeeping, I think it's also an acknowledgement for those that have just joined or are busy joining, um, that we're recording the session. So if you have a problem with your image being on the session, you know, we will release it as a video that we can watch again and we'll share it with you so that you can kind of remind yourself of the conversations. If you have a problem with it, then please keep your video off because it would be a real pity um, not to be able to release this video because you don't want your face to be seen. So I think just as a formality, I'd like to mention that it's being recorded. And there are two recordings happening at the moment. The one is a backup, so um, but it stays within our, um, our group. Um, uh, the next part of this process is that we are obviously going to have presenters who are going to be sharing their screens and in that you know they're going to be taking over your screen so to speak as you would might have experienced in the past if you've used Zoom before and for that um, you can sit back relax and watch what happens. Um, however it, it is quite fun to toggle in your in your um, top right hand corner if you're working on a, on, a, on a computer between the different viewing functions. So in other words, you could have a speaker view or a gallery view on. And I'm saying this very specifically because um, one of the uh, presentations is actually gonna be in the form of a performance. And for that, that's, um, we're going to be doing a lot of taking over of your screen and also asking you to participate in different ways. Um, so, as far as that's concerned, I, I will be guiding you through that process and I'm going to be asking you to either turn your microphones off or on or your video off or on. I cannot control it from my side, even though I'm the host in the session, so I'm going to be asking you to do that. Um, otherwise, uh, you know, the whole process might be disrupted. We're going to have some live performances happening in that in the main performance. And for that, um, if, your, if your audio, for example, is on, it will completely disrupt what's happening in the session because your audio might be competing with some of the vocalists or the music. So that's just a simple formality. Um, if there are any questions, um, you can obviously um, just send them in the little chat or raise your hand. There's a little function that says raising hand. Um, yeah. So who would like to take the next step? given Roger's comment to me at the bottom. <laughs> if everyone's okay with it, I think we'll kick off with the performance. So for this performance journey, I hope you all brought a book with you. I'd like you to turn on your video and turn on your audio. And we're going to now kickstart the performance with each one of you opening your book in front of you so that we can see the title of your book so showing us the book that you are holding
And, by, and while holding the book, I would like you to please read out certain keywords, key phrases, sentences, so that we can create a kind of a poem or a cacophony of sounds that will kickstart our process. And try to do it in such a way that we can actually see the cover of your book while you're reading. Can you give me the patient's details, miss? Focus on feelings. Focus on feelings. What I'd like you to all do now is bring your book close, show us the inside spine of your book and flip through it so we can see the content of your book. I ask the performers to unmute themselves. Yeah, forgive me for chewing your book, bro.
I'd like you to take the piece of paper that you brought to the session and while Manzikazi and Molisile are still continuing their sounds, bring in that piece of paper and start to follow their movements, their sounds and their journey. If you can, you can turn off your light and just play around the reflection of your screen and the piece of paper and allow it to move around and creating a room that connects us all. Blow the screen with the paper, roll it up and look through, and tear it into pieces. Thank you for being part of that journey of ours. So I would like to just add that um, I will explain briefly in the last 30 seconds I've got. Um, 
that this has been a journey that we've been on for the last six months, actually for the last three years, because we've all collaborated together and worked on various planetarium shows and, and performances, etc. over the last three years. But over the last six months, we've confined ourselves to this platform of Zoom, and we've been doing these imaginary future explorations of how we could perform and co-produce over this channel. And you've seen a small snippet, a 10-minute snippet, which is a response a little bit to the question that we have around whose imaginary future. So that was my talk, my presentation. Thanks to an incredible team of participants. Um, that was beautiful. Thank you for those beautiful voices, drawings, movements, sounds, and yeah, can't wait for the next one. So I'd like to hand over to the next person to take this on. So Young, are you going to carry on? The screen is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, what a beautiful piece of um, performance uh, art um, to start a day. Now it's um, 7.30 in the morning here. And uh, we, we are having a bright, beautiful day in a very clear sky, which we didn't have for years because of um, all these activities. Now we, we have our clear skies back. Nina asked us, um, what are we learning now? Um, I think we are learning a lot. Um, I, I feel fortunate, uh, despite there are, are tragedies for sick people, but fortunate that we are forced to stop everything we've been carrying on without thinking much. Uh, we've been carrying on competitively, <laughs> been carrying out on uh, even destroying ourselves. Um, so we are forced to stop and uh, we are also forced to think what are essential, what are the things that are that we can't do without. Um, and this year, um, 2020, is a 20 years anniversary of when Navi started. Navi, Art Center Nabi started 20 years ago. Um, the aim was to bring together art science, art technology, and all these transdisciplinary things that were <clears throat> in vogue at that time, 20 years ago. Still in vogue, I guess. Um, and we've been carrying on um, doing things that, um, you know, very busy. Um, bringing together very diverse elements of, of the society, of the world, and be busy traveling here and there and always on the road. Um, and um, Nina was there and uh, so was Marcus. Marcus also did a wonderful performance last year in Gwangju. We um, celebrated um, also 25th year, is it? 25th year of Isaiah, 25th anniversary of I Isaiah um, 2019 in Gwangju last year. It was, uh, it was a big event. Some thousands of people um, all around the world uh, gathered and we celebrated um, the <clears throat> uh, performances, exhibitions, education programs, great symposium and everything. But now, um, scarcely a year after, <clears throat> now we are <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> we're living in an entirely different, um, almost uh, planet, it, it seems like. And so what, what are essential? This is also my question of um, planning another 20 years of Art Center Nabi. What are, um, what are the role, important essential roles for an art center to play? Um, now. <laughs> and it's, it's a daunting question. I'm working on it. And I'm very, so I'm very uh, grateful for having this opportunity to think back on our education uh, activities. Let's see. Um, <clears throat> like, um, okay.
right. Um, so many activities, um, uh, countless activities, but usually our, our past, um, our sort of business as usual um, education activities run, run in three uh, threads. One is incubating of uh, media artists. We've been doing it. We selected 20 to 30 um, up and coming media artists each year. And then uh, we incubated uh, for about nine months. We supply them with um, technologies, um, know-hows, um, and also financial support. And each year we, uh, yeah, we <laughs> sort of produced 20, 30 new emerging artists. And the other thread was a literacy program, uh, tech literacy. Um, so, you know, 20 years, last 20 years, it started from Web 2.0 web to all the way to AI and blockchain, all these new technologies. So we provided a literacy education for artists, designers, and um, practically anybody from age seven to um, 25 are willing to learn new technology and try to make it uh, make some use out of it. And our last uh, last thread was children, children's activities. So those are our main sort of threads of business as usual in in, in the education field. Um, but I now, as I said, uh, I was forced to look at so what are essential elements that I want to take. Um, to the next 20 years. I came up with three elements. Uh, so uh, my, 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 my talk is very brief because um, I, uh, this, is, this is all I've got. And from now on, I want to build uh, from here. So my basic three elements are first play, second subjectivity or self, and the third is nature. So these three elements I, I think are essential in, in our education uh, programs, activities in the next 20 years or more. So I'll just briefly look into um, the elements uh, one by one. First, play. So, um, of course, it's, it's, everybody knows that play is a, is a basic element of creativity. If you can't play, you can't, <laughs> you can't be uh, creative. And we've, uh, we've confirmed it our, in our various activities, especially with our children. Children are um, the, the, the best uh, players and they are therefore the most creative. Um, so providing children with a playground to play with, um, but play with what? Play with, um, many elements, but we didn't go, we didn't um, include the element of nature that much. It was mostly a um, playground of art, technology, and in a more urban uh, environment or classroom or urban env environment. So our next um, 20 years will focus on more on the nature, a natural element. Um, okay, I'll just learn through. So with the digital playground, so we um, experimented and showed many ways of playing. And in every way, children were ecstatic, ecstatic and so we were. So these are all these playing elements. Now we, I move to the self. Um, so um, also in line with um, whose knowledge, uh, Marcus said um, in his performance, whose knowledge for whose future, right? Whose knowledge. Um, so far, when, 
when we think of education and schooling, it's, um, you know, nobody really likes to go to school because school is the epitome, epitome of um, objectivity, oppression. You have to be, you have to be in queue, you have to follow the instructions and all these things. So in other words, um, I, the self, was uh, oppressed, has been oppressed and um, squashed even by the tyranny of modernity, objectivity. So how to free I and the self um, is, is a big question. And we found uh, through our experience, storytelling is a very um, effective tool for um, effective way of releasing the, um, the suppressed I and the self um, was especially very effective when we approached uh, underprivileged people group, this, this enfranchised group, such as um, uh, North Korean refugees and other um, refugees from around the world. Um, and we, uh, they were usually, they're quite closed. <laughs> they, they, um, they're very timid uh, about telling their stories. Um, and we approach them, I mean, rather than imposing them on, on yet another new things to learn in this new country, um, we approach them um, with, uh, well, why don't you tell your stories? with any tool you're comfortable with, such as um, camera phones or piece of paper, clays, whatever. And they begin to open up and they form even form relationship with um, the mediator and all that. So it's become a very emotionally, emotional journey for all of us. But I find it, it's very, in fact, they begin to open up and blossom and tell their stories and then they want to learn afterwards. Once their self uh, repressed self is released, then they're free to explore and free to uh, roam a new world, so to speak. So these are the um, series of projects called Project I. It's about celebrating the self and um, really trying to dig out what's inside us. It's also a, a change of paradigm in learning because um, in Western traditional learning, we, um, at least the, the version we have is, we treat every, uh, everyone as sort of idiot, <laughs> as nothing and, um, you know, valuable things need to be filled in from our side, but it's the opposite. Our, um, this paradigm is the other way around. We already have inside ourselves what's valuable. And it's just the uh, learning is just to take out and, and express it and communicate it in a way that is communicatable to other people that is more, uh, thanks. Um, so these are the, all the DIYs and um, about celebrating the self. The last one, um, is, um, this is not, maybe I'll show you, um, your video. Uh, this is not about children, but it's, uh, I brought in a bunch of, um, oops, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll just, um, okay. I brought in a bunch of, um, um, uh, programmers, coders, and um, threw, threw them in the ocean and I, I, we, we taught them how to surf. And, um, and before, you know, all these programmers and they were sort of very rigid and they were not very communicative. But after one day in the ocean, surfing, learning to surf together and using the body and, you know, using a few of the, uh, the waves themselves, um, they came back and uh, we, we did a hackathon with them for two days and the result was uh, phenomenal. It was, uh, we had the best result of 
a blockchain was a blockchain hackathon blockchain hackathon in, in the country and these people got all the rewards and in korea and abroad and they were very happy they still talk about it when are we going to have the uh, crypto um hackathon again so i'm sorry so um so this is um this is it so you know to sum three elements how to uh, build the new programs three elements of play self and nature that's it thank you Great. Do you want to take over? Yeah. Hello. Can you see this? Yes. Yeah. Well, good night. Good morning. Uh, it's seven at night here. I mean, uh, close to the city of Belo Horizonte in Brazil. Uh, well, my name is Fred Paulino and just make a brief presentation of myself. Uh, I have a background in computer science and contemporary arts. I've been working with graphic and web design for more than 20 years now. And 12 years ago, uh, all this uh, uh, had a confluence on this Gambiology project that happened in my life uh, suddenly. And since then, I've been working basically with Gambiology. Uh, this was the first piece we created in 2008. Uh, Gambiology is inspired on what people call life hacks. So it's this popular cult culture that we have sp specifically in third world countries where people lack resources and have to make creations uh, with the resources that are available uh, using improvisation. Uh, I, I believe that there's creation of technology on this type of solutions. So we started to play with this and to transform this to a kind of a, a aesthetics a specific uh, type of aesthetics mixing up this sense of improvisation with electronics so this was the first piece that we did as a collective and this was the last uh, installation that we did together in 2014. Uh, from 2015 on Gambiologia we, we broke the collective and I started to work basically by myself involving more people so today Gambiologia works as a platform more than a collective uh, basically doing collective exhibitions like those uh, publications we have a magazine of Gambiologia which is in the fifth edition now and working in education we were the pioneers in maker education in Brazil. We started doing workshops on electronics and reusing and uh, trying to combine this notion of technology and robotics and electronics to reusing and somehow uh, uh, social work. So these are a few pieces that we've been creating uh, since then. Uh, on this path, I, I, I'm especially interested in, in working with people who live on the margins. You know that Brazil is a country that we have uh, a lot of social uh, inequalities and working on this type of uh, ambience, of places, is especially rewarding because you know 90% of, of students work in public schools in Brazil, uh, but only private schools have, for example, labs for working with techno technology and so 
So we're going to these places like the favelas, which is where this program, this, these pictures I'm showing took place, is especially rewarding. Well, um, this is something that the Ministry of Education in Brazil said two or three days ago, that the problem of educational inequality was only evidenced by the pandemic, but not caused by the pandemic. It's not a problem of the Ministry of Education. It's the initiative of each school. It was not a problem created by us. Brazilian society is unequal, and it is not now that we through the Ministry of Education, will be able to make everyone equal. So you can imagine how, uh, what, what's the type of guidance that we have in Brazil now during this pandemic. Especially in education, what, we, what, uh, what is happening now is that uh, those inequalities are getting stronger and stronger and stronger. Well, I decided to focus my talk on, uh, on margins. I live in a small village close to the city I was born. This is the main square of where I live. And this is the road to come here. Beautiful, isn't it? By the other side, we have mining companies all around. And the, and, the, and the struggle of environmentalists and us to avoiding them to take more and more space in mountains and everything around for, uh, for sending iron to everywhere in the world for doing notebooks like many of us are using now, for example. Uh, I decided to talk to schools based in rural parts of Brazil. I did that in the last two weeks. And just to randomly bring some, uh, some points of noticing. Wow, I, I have six minutes gone. Sorry, Marcos. Uh, the first is the, is the public school uh, based here where I live. I, t I talked to the director and what they're doing now in the pandemics uh, is a mix of recording uh, lessons and send, uh, publishing uh, in WhatsApp groups. And they have printed activities that uh, the parents of the students need to pick up in the school once a week and then in the next week, deliver to the teachers, uh, check, and et cetera. It's a school with 500 students. Uh, and uh, only 2% of them would be allowed to, to have online lessons live. So this was a type of life hack that they had to do for keeping with, with the classes. The second experience is this is based in this place, which is a quilombo. It's in the it's in the countryside of uh, Rio de Janeiro State. A quilombo is a is a reminiscence. It's like a ghetto. It's a it's a rural community uh, that came from slavery. So slaves went to the countryside part of Brazil to form these small communities a hundred years ago, and so and so. Are them now. This type of place that lacks everything, uh, basic needs. Uh, this I, I talked to the di director of the school of this place. They, they have a population of 130 people and the school has 40 students. Um, basically, they didn't have anything for five months during the pandemic until the director decided to go once a week to the school on Mondays and prepare uh, exercises and lessons for all, uh, all terms and deliver in each house. And then, to, uh, then the next week, it picks up the results of the exercise. So basically, the director is acting as, the, as teacher for the whole school. 
And the third is this favela in my city, Belo Horizonte. This is where I worked last year in a program that I created called Favela Haklab. And they have this school called Israel Pinheiro, which uh, has a thousand students. And they changed the system during pandemics uh, three times, basically, because they started to make this type of uh, delivery, or, uh, delivering lessons. But the, uh, the, the pandemic grew up too much at, at some point in the community. So they, they decided to stop meeting to pick up and deliver papers, etc. They made the, uh, uh, like a, a quest in the community to, to check which platform would be the best to work with. And they decided to have three different systems. So they, they are doing WhatsApp for the youngest uh, kids, like from three to five years old. They are doing Facebook groups, so the so the teachers record lessons and send, and then they and and then uh, through the inbox they send back the results because it was the easiest. And what was interesting is that for the last term, the school made a campaign for donation of mobile phones because those are able to to, to uh, uh, log in on Google Classroom. And so the, the last term is doing uh, through Google Classroom. And yeah, that's it. Sorry, Marcus, I, I lost, because I'm translating from Portuguese to English, so. <laughs> well, there, there are common things on the experiences I talked to which is the politicization of the of pandemic. So we have different solutions uh, for federal municipalities. Uh, personal intervention by schools staff. So we depend on people, on charity of directors and teachers, basically to have the system school keeping on going. Uh, complementarity or uh, family and school. So the, the need for family intervention is very evident. Uh, the necessity for update of the teachers, access to technology is not the problem that may be, but, but the access, the connection is the problem because many times they are not able to buy for the service. They have the mobile, one mobile in the family, but not, can't, uh, can't pay for the access. Social media is more present than video conference platforms like Zoom. And the experience of socialization is ir irreplaceable. So even the school who is, is having a good experience during the pandemic uh, won't keep with this uh, after pandemic ends, if it ends. So they are coming back to the old system anyway. Uh, conclusions is that diversity, solidarity, engagement, tolerance, sustainability, skills, empathy, and creativity mediated, mediated by technology is what I consider is necessary from now on. So yeah, I, I think it's more a human question now than a technological question, but I would say that maybe inverting this is the best thing to do. So technology should not be in the center, but should work for bringing to communities, all those concepts and possibilities. Uh, based on this, I created a, an institute with some friends in, my, in the village I live in last year to work with that uh, possibilities in mind. And my, just to conclude, I consider that if we don't uh, change immediately what uh, the type of approach to look into the margins and richest countries looking to to uh, poorer countries so we are on the margins as well somehow what will happen is something that happened here one year ago two years ago 10 kilometers from where i live 
this is a a dam from a mining and what happened is that for the omission of the mining company 200 people died we must avoid that to happen with the whole world Thank you and sorry for the time. Uh, should I start? Go for it. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, Fred, for sharing this uh, very impressive presentation. And uh, yeah, here in Beijing, it's uh, 7 a.m., so it's also a very beautiful start uh, to share sort, uh, the sort with all of you. So uh, I'm Joey. I'm, a, I'm a, a curator, a researcher, and also a teacher in, in uh, China uh, Central Academy of Fine Arts. And uh, yeah, I, I would like to uh, share uh, my recent thoughts on uh, AST or yeah, many um, different um, directions. So uh, CAFA, we, uh, we call uh, Central Academy of Fine Arts as uh, CAFA. Uh, this is, a, a, I can see the best art school in China. So, uh, uh, and recently uh, during the uh, COVID-19, uh, I find there's a uh, uh, AST booming uh, in China uh, because I was uh, invited to many um, art schools uh, around China for the uh, online lectures uh, on AST. That's why I find there are so many uh, art schools interested in AST. So you can see um, there are um, different cities and different schools. Uh, and also, uh, CAFA this year uh, set up an AST um, uh, research school after uh, COVID-19. This is a very uh, significant sign. And uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, I would like to uh, deliver some thoughts on my three different I identities. First, as a teacher. So uh, I initiated two courses uh, recently. One is uh, art and neuroscience. Uh, also, we can call brain-inspired AI. And um, I think it's a new uh, direction to reconsider um, body and mind um, um, in this uh, new scenario. And also another is uh, art and uh, ecology. That's the same, uh, I think, um, yeah, uh, we can say we, we, we pay attention on nature again. And um, sorry, uh, some of these uh, texts are, are Chinese, uh, but uh, uh, this is, um, the outline is mainly about the, the how people uh, in the East and West think on um, also um, other um, cultural background and uh, uh, their thoughts on nature, on um, uh, Anthropocene or uh, Geyer or, and also uh, how the movement uh, are based on that. So it's uh, uh, two causes. And uh, uh, I just feel uh, during the COVID-19, uh, there are more, um, online courses, uh, lectures, and so there are more possibilities so, because people can, like us, um, we don't need to fly around and we just sit and share thoughts. That's more, um, there, so there are more possibilities. And uh, uh, as a researcher, um, there's a trend, uh, I think in China from media art to we call um, AST. Uh, of course, AST is, is not a new term, but uh, 
in, in Chinese uh, scenario, uh, we have this um, AST under rematerialization um, uh, context because the uh, media art is based uh, um, mostly in the like screen. We just face to a screen, but uh, uh, you can see the biomedia, uh, ecological, and uh, space art. They're uh, back to um, how to say uh, real world again. So we we consider it, it might be a new uh, movement. And uh, uh, we ha uh, Kafa have this uh, conference called Education, Art, Science, and Technology. So it start from 19, uh, sorry, uh, 2017, and we invite many um, speakers around the world. Uh, I think some are our old friends, like Roy, uh, like uh, Manovich, like um, Katz. And uh, we also uh, conduct a lot of workshops, uh, like cooperate with uh, um, um, how to say a uh, scientific um, institute uh, like this. Um, and this is uh, uh, um, 18. And we also have a like a writing workshop. Uh, like we invite um, um, someone from uh, executive um, editor from Leonardo and also uh, many like um, a media art historian. So we, we talk about the, the history and the, the, uh, the writing and different perspectives on AST. And this is uh, um, uh, how to say the, the, the workshop on the history of art, science, and technology. And uh, um, Katz, uh, he's the director of uh, uh, AST in uh, Chicago uh, Art Institute. And he gave a very, um, very nice. You can see there are so many participants, students, um, just come to, to listen. And uh, uh, this is a book uh, by a friend of mine, uh, Yu Kui, and uh, he's now based in Hong Kong. And uh, he gave a, um, like, raise a question, and, like, uh, is there, um, like, different cultural uh, contexts on technology? Because when we talk uh, about technology, it's like, seems like universal, because like, uh, gene editing, it's the same everywhere, but, Actually, uh, technology in some uh, how to say uh, extent they're they're uh, culturally diversified, and we have our own local knowledge. So that's why we we need to um, yeah. I really appreciate this um, uh, conference because it's it's really uh, culturally diversified. Uh, and you could think there's also a techno um, diver diversity. So we need to think about this. Um, and as a curator. Um, we have several uh, big um, show on uh, media art, like this um, Beijing Media Art Finale. So we have first edition named as Ethics of Technology, second as Post Life. And uh, last year we had um, the 40 year uh, review of uh, Ars Electronica in, in, in um, Shenzhen. I'm also uh, uh, co curated it, and um, we have uh, their archive. And also we have this. Um, war for Leonardo because uh, you're, um, it's uh, one of the uh, visionary pioneers of uh, media arts. So people can, I mean, in China can learn more on the general uh, history of what's happening in the history of media arts. And uh, it take place in Shenzhen, which is considered as a uh, Silicon Valley in China. So there are many uh, te technical people and also art people uh, see this show. And it's, I think it's very important for the uh, theoretical and academic um, review on the uh, AST. And uh, for my own research, I'm uh, uh, um, uh, 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 how to say a researcher on bio art. So uh, we can see this uh, great, great uh, acceleration of um, biology. And I think after uh, COVID-19, people are focused more on um, how biology will, will influence this, uh, the society. And uh, uh, this is a show I curated last year um, called Quasi Nature. Uh, it's in Beijing, uh, uh, 798 Art District. And uh, it might be the first um, art show uh, systematically introduce bio art in China. So uh, I bring uh, several um, important, how to say, bio artists and some uh, young Asian artists, and then um, also some uh, research program. Uh, so my conclusion on uh, the, how to say, the uh, possibility in the future is uh, 
there might be ecological turn. People will pay more, uh, I, I mean, even uh, AST people will pay more attention on nature, on uh, ecology, on the environment we, we, uh, we live. And also, of course, AI uh, mania, we will, uh, it's also the same in China. So we will have more uh, cooperation with AI um, people and to explore the possibility like mind, uh, like uh, brain inspired AI, blah, blah. And also uh, we should pay more attention on uh, critical thinking on AST. Uh, last year I conduct a seminar on uh, gene editing because there's a gene editing baby um, um, uh, 2018 in, in China. So uh, I invited many people on um, uh, talk about ethics and a lot of um, uh, like kind of this topic. Um, and this is uh, what I'm uh, interested um, um, around this pan bio arts um, topic. The 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 uh, the right side is. Uh, uh, three topics that I will, uh, I think we will pay attention to like art and the uh, uh, microorganism and the biopolitics and also art and uh, ecology environment and also art and uh, AI and uh, neuroscience. And the left, left side is what we can, uh, I mean other um, majors or uh, directions we can cooperate with like the history of science, STS, uh, media study and uh, yeah, philosophy. So many people uh, I'm now working with that will make I think the um, AST more um, how to say uh, become in depth. And uh, the last uh, page is um, yeah I think um, what what I'm thinking the chance how to do AST in uh, chance cultural because uh, the notion what is life. It's 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 uh it's very different um, between different cultures like uh, here we in um, East Asian and also um, in um, Europe or in uh, Mexico and other uh, districts and I would uh, conduct another uh, research trip on like do, um, doing such kind of transcultural um, trip on AST so. Uh, yeah, it's a very uh, quick review just to, to share a little thoughts on what's going on here in China and uh, what I'm, I'm doing. And uh, I hope uh, there are more uh, communication after this very quick and uh, very uh, brief introduction. Thank you. Joe Wei, what is life where you are? What is life where I am? Or where Joe Wei is? Or where I am? <laughs> so Before I, we... just, I feel, how, how many seconds do I have, Mar Marcus? I'm not going to timekeep anymore. We we finished with our official presentation, so to speak, because our last okay. presenter wasn't here. So I, so I, I, I did send a, a talk title and abstract, but I'd like to do another performance. All right. So can everybody close their eyes? And those of you with the camera off, close your eyes too. Open your left eye, only your left eye. Look, close it again. Close both eyes. Open your right eye, only your right eye. Look, close it again. Open both eyes. What did your left eye see that your right eye did not see? What did your right eye see that your left eye didn't see? Huh. Your two eyes are not in the same life. They don't exactly see the same thing. And to be honest, listening to all of us, I'm, uh, I feel humbled. 
Um, and this time of pandemic, I'm calling it World War III. And it's the combination of climate change and a virus. And we thought World War III was gonna be atom bombs. So we made the physicists into generals. Now we need to make the biologists and the environmentalists and the doctors into generals and we need to fire all the soldiers. We don't need soldiers anymore. We need more biologists, more environmental scientists. I call this, it's both the Anthropocene and the Coronacene. We have built a society that transmits viruses, not through the internet, but by shaking hands, kissing each other, hugging. How do we learn to be intimate again? I'm gonna end that I'm working with Leonardo on, as part of our experimental publishing, experimental obituaries. I don't know in how each of your cultures, we remember people that are no longer alive, whatever that means, Joe Way, what is life? Yesterday, my PhD advisor, Stuart Boyer, died of COVID-19. How to remember him. Two weeks ago, a friend of mine, Rick Brittell, died. He'd been the director of the Dallas Art Museum, and his dream was to close the university and to reinvent the Greek Athenaeum. Close all the universities and all the schools. And as Pedro said, the students become the teachers. We need the students to teach us. They're the digital natives who know more technology than all their teachers do. They know the new directions that technology can take us. And Joe, I agree with your inversion. Technology is just a tool. What we need is indeed your map. And I've forgotten the exact words, but yes, we should use your map to direct the technology in different directions. And so, and I'm gonna contradict and I figured who it was who was talking about the self. We don't need any more geniuses like Leonardo da Vinci, especially male geniuses, although he was gay. We need more groups of people that be behave like geniuses. When I look at Fred's hacker maker spaces in a village in Brazil, that's not I, it's we. We need to not put the I forward, but the we forward. Let me stop there. Close your eyes. Open your left ear. Close it. Open your right ear. Close it. Open both your ears. Did your left ear hear something that your right ear didn't hear? Did your right ear hear something your left ear didn't hear? Ha, huh. eyes and ears function very differently. I'll stop there, thank you. No more geniuses, <laughs> especially male ones. Joel? <laughs> um, I, 
first off, I, I, I wanted to thank um, all the presenters, uh, so young, Fred, Joe, Marcos, um, and, and Nina for, for, you know, organizing today's um, experience uh, event. Um, I, I, I thought it uh, offered a lot of uh, provocation from from different vantage points, but I had a few a couple takeaways, and the first was that it it reconfirmed for me this idea of a need for a you know twenty first century new social architectures for learning that we're just unfamiliar with at this moment as we're struggling through the pandemic to literally make ends meet and survive. Um, and as part of that, that um, character of learning, or, or perhaps it's a priority um, in learning, it has to do with how, how do we learn to cope with change? You know, how do, we, how do we learn to address the needs, these needs that are, that are context specific and are, require ec the expertise of localized knowledge? and advantage technologies, but are not dependent upon them um, as they start to emerge new ways of, of doing things, but also um, new business models for how the world might, might look or function here in the next few years, which is, I think, going to be radically different than what we, we currently know. But most importantly, and Roger, I think this, this sort of seconds uh, a notion that you're you're, you're, you're proposing, which is how do we elevate the, the youth and the, who, you know, the student to the teacher. Um, and I see this as, a, as, a, as the challenge of, of leadership transformation. How do, we, how do we make that jump from the current state of the, you know, the teachers filling the students as vessels for knowledge reception to invert that model so that we literally build networks of leadership that are more inclusive, more diverse, more bringing you know, fresh, uh, ex the experience of play as So Young pointed out. And there really does need to be a new platform or new sets of platforms, new architectures upon which that kind of activity can happen. And those things are not here. And we need to really focus on those. Anyway, I found this a very interesting conversation. I just wanted to, again, thank everyone for their participation. And I'll leave it at that. Hello. Are you here, Marcus? Hello, I just would like to say a couple words. We heard today from various places around the world. It's not so easy to get uh, a direct continuation on, uh, in this vein, but I really would like to have an opportunity. Maybe we won't be able to have it uh, in a big Zoom like this, but I would like to hear from children from the students themselves around from different places. What is their experience? Because uh, that's something we really don't have enough of and we don't have enough visibility for it. That's all, okay? And thank you again, Marcus. So Nina, maybe we could ask Vania to tell us how it is in Guanajuato, Mexico. Sure, please okay. Vania. O O C A B. Vanya, are you there? I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, are you wearing all, your O Are you wearing your O C A D bracelet? Oh uh, no, I'm not. Um, hang over it. Okay. So basically. Um, first of all, uh, thank you very much for inviting me here, for giving me a chance to speak. Uh, thank you very much, Marcos, for 
helping us because we are newbies in this um, Zoom conferences. So we're very confused. Second of all, um, what uh, Roger is talking about is my ACAB um, charm my sister made. Uh, it stands for all cops are bad. I don't actually all, know if all, all cops, are, cops bad. are bad. Say that loud in English. All cops are bad. And my all cops are bad. All physicists are bad too. <laughs> I don't know if all physicists are bad, but I don't know uh, a lot of physicists, but I know a lot of police brutality um, in every place. And I've seen it here in Mexico. I've seen it in my city and I've seen uh, women uh, trying to, to uh, get their voices heard and police arresting them and uh, hitting them and abusing of them. So I actually do not believe there are a lot of good cops. I don't want to generalize, but I don't know. I, I, I don't trust them. Second of all, uh, third, the third question was about education. Um, I just recently got out of college. I um, uh, recently graduated a uh, graphic designer. So thankfully, I didn't have the chance to, uh, to get online education. My sister is the one that's having online classes, and all I can say is kind of like torture. Uh, it's very difficult for someone who's used to go to school, like actually walk into a classroom and for now just turning on a computer and listening four hours of a class, it's not the same. You don't get the same. I, I don't believe you're getting the same education. I don't believe you, you're getting the same hype of going to school. I don't believe you're getting uh, the same, I don't know, the same passion of studying. It, for me, it's not the same being online and listening to a computer all afternoon. Rather, I would rather be at school and listening to a teacher. It's, for me, it's better because I can chat to another one. I can ask the teacher. And I don't feel like I'm just staring at a computer. And also the teacher doesn't feel like they are just staring at a, at a computer because most of the students don't turn on their cameras. So they're just talking and talking and talking and they don't know if the student is sleeping, if the student is on Facebook, if the student is even uh, close to the computer, maybe they just logged in to the class and they walked away and they are like, I don't know, on a date or something like that. So um, I don't believe we're, at least in Mexico, I don't believe we're ready to have online education. Um, I mean, I already talked about not having the same passion as going physically to the school, but also not everyone in Mexico has access to internet. Like, like barely half of the population has access to Wi-Fi and less than the half of the population has a, a computer in their house. So it's not easy for them to have like these uh, online classes. Uh, the government has started making these online classes on TV. So now you change the channel and you have a class on TV but it's the same thing. Not everyone has a TV. There are communities of indigenous people that didn't even know that classes were a thing this semester. Like they just believe they, there was no school anymore. And in Mexico, education is like a pyramid where the basic education, like primary school, it's uh, maybe 98% of the kids go to, but then as it gets like uh, more uh, harder, for, so to say, as it, it gets closer to university or to college, people start uh, dropping out and they start uh, losing interest. So if they are not 
so interested in going to school, like to physical school, what makes me believe that someone that doesn't have the, maybe not the chance or the ability or the interest to go to college, what makes me believe that now that everything's online will make them have the, I don't know, the chance or, or, or if they would like to go to school if, if it's online. So I think um, now it's really hard, maybe for third world uh, countries. I don't want to call my Mexico a third world country, um, but it's kind of the way it is. So I believe it's, it's difficult. It's not the same as being in the US and just uh, enrolling on a university or something like that, or school, even primary school. It's, I don't think it's that easy for Mexicans or for indigenous people, for these uh, people that are poor maybe and don't have the chance to have online education and they will just drop out of school and then what will happen with, with Mexico and with the physicists we need so much. Oh, uh, hello. Uh, I'd like to respond to Roger. Roger, are you there? My name is So Young Ro. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not here. <laughs> I'm not alive. Online. Please be alive. Day. Please be alive. Thank you. Um, you mentioned, um, uh, I just want to make a short remark on the self, because I don't think I explained it very well, given the limited time. You know, the notion of self is not a closed book. It can be approached through very diverse ways. And uh, without just closing the book on the self, and self is, you know, is, is bad, is futile, um, it has the danger of leading us all to totalitarianism, which is a really uh, another grave danger, along with the virus and uh, what was the other one? The climate change. Um, people so easily give up on the notion of self and um, this uh, hard, hard uh, job of uh, discovering who re we really are. And, um, and in, in also in the field of education, I think that should be the basis of all the learning. It's about what is a true self. Um, there's no end, there's no right answer, but it should be approached um, more um, in different ways. Like, like what we are doing now, we, we approach the subject of education through you know, different cultures. And in um, Eastern traditional culture, there's a, something called small I and big I, big self, small self. Um, it's like small mind and big mind. Um, if, um, if you have, if you approach uh, who you are in the right way, then you are um, bound to be connected. You're bound to meet the big self, which is we, as you say. So there, okay, there might and, be and, a and, little... Okay, and I'm so glad that you put it that way, because as the artist Stella taught me, we all love false dichotomies. Mm. I, we. Mm. That, and mm -hmm. you just made yeah. me think about it is a continuum. Yes, it is. The small is. I, the and slightly the big bigger eye. eye, the bigger eye, and the very big eye, which is totalitarian. No, 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 it's not totalitarian. You're kidding. <laughs> well, it's, no, uh, yeah. Um, it's the opposite and, of it. Just the no, opposite. but you know, Stella changed my life when I was in his studio and he built himself a robotic third arm mm -hmm. and himself to write with three hands. And I always tell this story. And he said, you know, Roger, I can no longer say on the one hand this, on the other hand that, because my third hand says, hold on a second, what about me? So yes, I think, you know, I, you're totally right. This idea of the I and the we as separate things is wrong. 
right? Mm -hmm. It's a continuum yeah, yeah, between okay. the small eye and the big eye. <laughs> and so we're uh, in the big eye, Roger, you and me, <laughs> and all well, of us. What, what is spooky, <laughs> I don't know how you're doing, but, but I feel like you are looking me in my eyes. Uh-huh. Even yeah, though we're so? near the camera and Vanya, gee, I, for a one second, I thought that So Young and I were in the same room. Somehow, mm -hmm. she looking him in the eye, she said, Roger, you're wrong. And Roger said, you're right. Okay. Well, at least you got my name. Thank you. Well, <laughs> I, I, I've known your name a long time, and I nearly made it to Isaiah, but didn't. <laughs> Thank you for acknowledging me. Thank you. <laughs> now, oh, now you're making me feel, oh, my God. <laughs> I'm an atheist, okay. so I shouldn't say my God, because I, I don't got, think gods exist. But uh, no, but and in education, as I put on the chat, the biggest problem, and, and Joel and I have talked about, is how you learn to forget. And mm -hmm. grown-ups have forgotten how to forget. And there are some things we must learn to forget in the post-pandemic world. And the easy part of it is, in order not to spray germs, you wear masks. You don't shake hands, you bow or knock elbows. So you have to forget a lot of things to survive uh, for the pandemic. And I think it is the children and the students who are the teachers. Do we, do, we, do we have a choice about what we forget or what not to forget? How can you choose? Okay, I, my I, I think, I think we friend here, to... Marcus, let me just finish the, the yeah. dialogue here. Um, my very good friend, Kasini Nazir here, uh, is now teaching how to design your curiosity. Hmm. So I guess designing your forgetfulness would go with designing your curiosity. Thank you. <laughs> I, I wanted to add that I think the process that one goes through in evoking memory that we didn't even know we had um, is another component where we could either choose what to remember, what to forget. I mean, we, we can't forget something that we, we never realized we had in the first place. I think it sounds kind of a complicated expression, but the, the journey that we've been through and that you saw the snippet of earlier um, of individuals, students, professionals, in terms of artists, scientists, experimenting in this, in this platform and actually provoking each other to try new things, to explore new things and actually stumbling on a kind of common connectivity that we've all shared in a strange way, even though we're completely different. And there's something that, that for me personally, and I don't know, some of the participants are still here, um, sitting in different cities in South Africa, uh, trying to make sense of the pandemic and everything else, that realize that there's, a, there's, there's something else that connects us. There's a different memory that we, that has nothing to do with apartheid, it's got nothing to do with um, how we're learning now, but I, I think it touches on, on the tangibility that Vanya was talking about in terms of being present in a room is one thing. But I think it, it goes much deeper to a, to, to a sense of being that we all understand as human beings that, that we have forgotten. Um, that I think that, forget the pandemic, pre-pandemic, we've already been in that state of denial around certain mediated technologies and how we really engage with the world. Uh, you know, how TV news just floats through us and it doesn't really become anything that we need to take serious anymore. And I think when Fred, when you showed that, that clip of the of the of the mudslide or the, the 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 motion of nature taking over um people's lives it kind of was very evocative for me and 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 triggered something in me in the reality that um we were going through in our performative state um in the last performance or not tonight but in the last performance where we really looked at the apocalypse you know the end of end of the city that we live in now based on the abuse on the planet that we've that we've offered and the deep-rooted ability to identify that between each other to realize that we are actually at fault is a memory that we we have 
and I think that is the one that's in all of the presentation has somehow be evoked, been evoked again for me. There's a certain sense that of urgency. There's a, sense, a certain sense of acknowledgement that we cannot continue this way. And I think that is a memory component that is, I think, been with the human being um, since the beginning of time called survivalism. And so I think that there's there, there, there are interesting notions here that um, I'm quite keen to understand how we are learning and uh, teaching, tapping into some of these moments. And I think the performative and the co-production space is really one of those. And if we can use the technology to do that, that's great. And uh, Marcus, I think some of, some of your friends and colleagues in South Africa have stayed up very late at night. Maybe we could ask them to speak. So is anybody in South Africa still on the session? Yeah. I see. Bangwana. Well, you see there? You want to share something, Molly and Tuli? How are you feeling? <laughs> I think they're, they're so knackered from <laughs> the day. I mean, it is. Uh... Maria. Molly, Molly is coming forward. Oh, good. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah. Um, well, I think for us, both of us were sitting here. We just listen and just want to learn and really observe in this kind of conversation. Because they are very important for us. As people who are growing up at, at this time of COVID-19, you know, something that we never really um, predict in a way that will happen in our lifetime, because we always hear good stories from our great-grandmothers and our mothers about what was happening in our old age. And when we, when we experience such things, you, you start to ask yourself what's going to happen in the near future, because if things like this are happening now, so you, there are a lot of questions that are going in our minds. And also as also as performers as well, you know, how how theatre is gonna change and how entertainment industry is gonna change in a way, you know. So there are a lot of things that are happening that are going to our mind. I, I, I would love to add, if I may, um just knowing how Nolly and Tuli have been going through this performance, um, there was a really meaningful and, and, and emotionally very charged moment for me in the last performance we did together where the two of you performed between a, you had between the two of you a security gate. Even though you live in the same home, you, Nolly was in the inside and Tuli you were on the outside and you were pushing and fighting to be with each other through this gate. And it brought me to tears. You know, it was this reality check that we were being separated as human beings from those that we love in such an intense way. And you captured that in your performance. I, I'll share it later to the group and I'll send you a link to, the, to that moment in that performance, which was just so incredibly charged. And it made me realize that that's the communication technology we need to use to, to get messages across. I'm, I, I personally am struggling with the notion of talking about these things when you have the most incredible creative individuals expressing these moments, but they're not being seen at the moment because they can't perform. So how do we create platforms to edu actually educate the world around these challenges by somehow giving value to it and to acknowledge that there are two, for example, in this case, incredible performers doing something that we that will touch each one of us because we've all experienced it. I see a very old friend, Ronaldo Thompson. Where, where are you and would you like to tell us what you think about the future of education? Well, hello everyone, how are you? Uh, I'm happy to have this uh, event uh, just in my table. And uh, well, very nice experience from everywhere uh, in the world. Uh, of course, this has changed uh, the education in many different ways. We never experienced this before, and we never thought that we will be teaching on in front of a screen. And uh, I think this will change for good and for bad. 
in a way because of course we are used to the uh, physical contact i mean to be with the students there in front of us and talking to everybody and now we have we have to this to do this uh distance uh, courses, which uh, in a way, uh, I mean, it depends on, on the skills of uh, the students and the professors as well. Because, I mean, it's quite different to, to prepare a class for, uh, for a uh, virtual presentation than prepare it for, uh, for the students that you have in front of you. So uh, my experience had been in a way, uh, I mean, good because actually I was on sabbatical the, the last year. So I didn't uh, have to deal with uh, going to class and I was, I was doing more research than uh, confronting the students. But uh, now that I have to uh, start uh, with my virtual courses, I think uh, in a sense, I have to be more uh, skillful in a way to, to attract the attention of the students. Because I think someone was mentioning that the students may not be there in front of the computer. Maybe they are doing something else and they just connect on the, on the screen, but then they left. And I realized that last week, actually, because I, was, I, was, uh, I asked them to, to read some books, some chapters of some books. And then uh, some students were talking about what the experience of the reading. But then when I asked some students that I realized that they didn't talk at all, I realized that they were not there. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, the, the students, I think, those who, who wants to learn and wants to, that are interested in the courses, they are all the time there. The others that they are just getting a grade, I think they go connect the computer and then they left and they go wherever they want to. So, uh, it's, it has been right different. Now, though. Uh, why do you yeah. think that face to face they were there yeah that's true that's true they they <laughs> yeah that's true also but uh, at least you if they are not uh, like uh, paying attention to you 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 ask a question and then uh, they realize that uh, you are you are you are paying attention about them so yeah that's uh, that's uh, is different but uh, well it's something that no one expected no one no one had planned this before so i mean it has changed and in a way probably this uh, actually bania was mentioning before not all the people have access to internet not all the people has a, a computer and even some people don't have uh, televisions in their houses but i think this will change uh, i mean this will make the politicians aware of what uh, People really need. I mean, they so need. We so, Ronaldo, we close down the schools and buy everyone computers. Well, uh, that would be maybe the solution for the people that have not even uh, money to pay a, a bus to go to the to the universities. I mean, there are some people that doesn't have even money to pay a bus and to send the kids to the student to the schools. So, and there are many people that have no access to to health. So uh, this may make, I think, politicians would be more uh, aware of that, all the needs of the people that, uh, I mean, because there are many different levels in uh, society, so politicians many of the times forget the ones that need the most. So I think this, in, in a way, is, uh, is going to be a good opportunity to try to solve many problems that we have in society. I see someone I don't know, James Tanton. Are you there? <laughs> Nina wants to say something. Oh, sorry, Nina, go ahead. I just would like, this is really, we have to conclude soon, I think, but I really would like to say that connection and connecting is really something we should carry on. It is uh, partly my role in life to connect people and correct events. And, but I would like to encourage everybody. So if you have any ideas, maybe it's possible to uh, send a note to Imaginary Futures or uh, connect, uh, contact any of us. But if we can keep connecting and talking about these issues, I'm sure that we will get much further. Thank you. 
Lindy. Sylvia. Yogi. Hi, everybody. I'm very happy to meet you all. And I'm um, so excited to experience uh, what you're doing together. And then I felt quite alienated because I am a physicist. And I felt like I suddenly was no longer welcome in the conversation and it hurt my feelings. <laughs> <laughs> I teach at university, I've taught at university for years, and we believe that the future of education is a process that teaches people how to learn on their own. It teaches them the process of finding information and knowing what it means and using it to solve their own problems in their own ways. And we believe that this solution should be in community and co-working centers outside of schools and universities. So that's an idea to share. And it's a very interdisciplinary idea and it would combine all of our different interests and pursuits together into one classroom rather than separating us into silos where we can be stereotyped. So thank you for letting me speak today. So you know, one, one term that came up for me several times, and just in the last few minutes actually, was just this, this whole notion around distance and distance learning. And if you think about what distance is, you know, it, it being the this, this space between two or more things, um, and distance learning really has been focused on the things, not on the distance, not on the space, not, not on the, the, what's in between. And, and in a way, that, that is the most politicized space around this whole technological um, challenge that we're, we're, we're up against. How do we define distance? What, what constitutes distance? And what kinds of mediations can take place in it that are not taking place um, <laughs> at the endpoints? So it's just it's very interesting um, opportunity there to, to sort of poke holes in this uh, this whole notion of what distance learning is. Um, I would also like to add on the, you know, online studying and learning. Um, although it has its advantages, like it has advantages, it also has a disadvantage because um, when I was helping my little sister with her research, um, and the research was about human contact. Is it necessary and is face-to-face um, -face learning necessary? And at some point that we realized that it is necessary because in the research we also found that um, most of the students that perform better, perform better because of the contact they have with the teacher. Being in class itself is helpful and it helps them get higher grades. Um, rather than learning, because we do learn at home, we do do self-study, um, do online learning and stuff like that, where you get taught, but it's quite different and the experience is not as natural as you do it at school. I think the world has kind of also presented itself in such a way that we've been taught to learn a certain way. So you know, to undo that and unravel that will take a while. I mean, I'm especially thinking of the schools of Bloemfontein, uh, Sylvia, that, that you're at, um, is very different in terms of the, the, the cultural significance of going to school, the, the, the reality of what it means that your parents, I'm not saying yours, but uh, some <laughs> of the students that I've worked with, um, parents that are really struggling to keep their family going and that you know, brothers and sisters have to take care of each other um, because their parents are working and they become caregivers as well. And so the reality of going to school is a completely different social structure than being at home and being responsible for home. And it, it has all kinds of connotations and understanding. So it's a very layered and difficult thing to just say, oh, well, we'll just do it on the screen because it's not about having the access to technology very often. It's got to do with the construct around it and the responsibility that a lot of young people are carrying in not just South Africa. It goes into many other countries um, where the need is so high for the youth actually to take on some of the roles and responsibilities that parents should be doing but can't for many reasons. 
And so I think that's, that's, that it's, it's, it gets more tricky the, 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 the further one looks into different contexts and, and digs deeper into those in, in spaces. Um, so I think, yeah. Sorry. I did like Lindy's comment about learning to learn on your own. Um, and I guess I, I'd complexify that a little bit. Um, Dr. Ivan Tina that I've worked with um, for six years is from Cameroon. And he told me this African proverb that to cross the Sahara Desert, go alone. To go further, go together with camels and goats. <laughs> uh, uh, and you need, you know, some things take, it, take teamwork, some things you can do, do, go alone. So learning together, we all know how effective peer group learning is. Um, and so, you know, this very idea that we need one way of teaching um, is contradictory with, um, you know, the whole discussion that we're having, that how you learn in South Africa may not be the same way you learn in Brazil uh, or in China or in Taiwan. Um, and so this idea that there's a universal way of teaching across the whole planet that does not recognize the local knowledge, the local realities, um, and that's one of the dangers of online teaching, right? I mean, you no, know, you're teaching to the whole planet the same way. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that's where I keep coming back to Pedro's real life experience in a village of 300 people with 40 children. You cannot teach the same way in that context than at Kafa in Beijing. <laughs> I think it's not only as um, distant as you're saying, comparing country to country. I think in parts it's comparing one neighborhood to the next, which is separated by one road, or, yeah, it's, or, or, or a couple of kilometers. You know, it's, it's not even um, country specific. I think it's almost uh, neighborhood specific. Um, so it's, it's fascinating to understand how we can then agitate and provoke across those. So where are those voices? How do we get the voices that are currently on this screen are fantastic. And, and I think it's amazing to hear all of this, but um, you know, the network of people that surround um, Fred with the research that you've done, you know, they, there's so many voices that you would have heard, but then three schools further on, probably you would have had another perspective. And I'm finding that um, gathering process so interesting. Uh, I do have a question. Being an artist, is to what role does what role does the art play in this journey? We're talking about providing technology. We're talking about providing the systems for communication. But to be able to cross some of these cultural barriers, to try and break through into smaller communities and smaller groups, and draw out some of that content, is not the creative practice one way of of gaining that relationship and that trust with the community that you want to engage before you slap them with a heavy textbook in, in, in digital format to say, this is what you have to learn. You know, is there not a different way of formulating it through a creative process? If there's anybody not there, will you please speak up? I know your screen is off. Okay, well, I'm here and also wasn't there when he called on me earlier. Forgive me, nature called. Um, I'm James. Ah, you weren't there. <laughs> I wasn't there. I had to step away for a moment. I apologize, but I knew I was called upon. <laughs> um, let me come at that tangentially from my, my perspective here. So I'm a mathematician, and mathematics is often seen as the most sterile, inhuman, uh, non-human uh, aspect of education. There's an edifice of knowledge that's been memorized and performed usually under speed, under pressure, and be correct the first time you try it, which is not what mathematicians experience as mathematics. Math mathematicians describe mathematics as creative, human, slow, and deliberate, and innovative. Um, I was a university professor, and I actually left the university world to become a high school teacher because I really wanted to bring the human joy of mathematics. And to me, I, I'm, I have to say, I'm deeply moved by so many of So Young's beautiful comments about connecting with the self, because to me, my mission in mathematics teaching has been to connect the health, health self to the human story of mathematics. I mean, there's a reason why humankind created these incredible, beautiful structures that we call mathematics, that the current education has been stripped away and made a very remote, sterile story. 
So to me, the artistic nature of mathematics has been stripped away from the education system. Let's return to the story of the human experience of mathematics for the self and for the, your connection, not only just you know, humanity of today, but for the past several millennia and for the millennia to come. You know, people say that diamonds last forever, but a result in mathematics truly lasts forever. <laughs> when, we know it's, when we know it's true, we know it's true. It's kind of stunning and beautiful. Um, so to answer your question, I would actually say we can, we can portray this, the content, those heavy textbooks, if you like, in that way that connects to ourselves and connects to our humanity. And to me, that is deeply creative, deeply artistic, and deeply human. So let's, let's, let's transform what, what content means. We don't need the content per se anymore. We just need how we process the content. And, okay. and if, if, form, if, form follows, if form follows content, then I'm quite excited to hear what will come out of that process because at the end of the day, um, at the moment, we've been cramming content into a form, which is cramming content into an educational system rather than saying, well, allow the content to speak through us and create the form. So I, I love that inversion. Thank you for that. L Lindy, would you like to say something? Thank you. I've, I've said I've said it all, but I've got a, it's very nice to hear from everyone else. Okay, I'm, I'm glad to hear from you, the, James, that you don't believe that mathematics is hu a human invention uh, and that mathematics on other planets and other solar systems in the universe is the same mathematics we have. Well, that's a very interesting question, is it not? So yes, is mathematics discovered or created? Um, that's true, um, but don't forget, we're full of our human biases. For example, we're very aware that communication requires a notion of self and other. Therefore, we're very aware of two states and maybe we'll discover binary system because of that. So as Douglas Adams says, maybe there's intelligent shades of blue out there which have a completely different notion of what it means to exist and be, that we humans are too limited to conceive of. So whether that's creating or discovering new mathematics is beyond our human capabilities, I don't know. What a lovely question that everyone should explore and ponder upon themselves. And share their views on it. Carol Beer, are you there? I am here. It's been a while since we've been in the same room at the same time. Have we ever? <laughs> okay, keep going. Well, I, I think it's important for us to learn to learn again. And I think that um, grades and testing are antithetical to the educational endeavor that is of learning. And I think there's a lot of going back to the basics that we can really benefit from. So simple. <laughs> so simple. I encourage everyone to find a paper plate and mark two points on the circumference and put those two points together and see that no matter where you put those two points, you will always result in a half a circle. And if only people knew that. And if you take a piece of paper and fold it in half and in half again and in half again, you'll have a table for multiplication. And I just wish people understood right from the basics what learning is all about. We don't seem to have a paper plate in our kitchen. <laughs> what do I have to do? You're, you're muted. It has to be round, so you're playing with the circumference. Oh, okay, James, we have a mathematical but, problem. How do I make a Roger, plate round? But Roger, fold that in half and fold it in half again. Fold it along a central and fold it in half again to make squares and fold it in half again to make rectangles and fold it in half again to make squares, almost squares, and then open it up.
and then count the squares and you have a multiplication table of rows and columns. So two times four is eight and three times four is 12 and four times four is 16 and a diagonal of squares, one, four, nine, 16. It still work as I told yep. you. Yep, 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 yep. Okay, thank you. thank you. So um, that was a beautiful little performance. Thank you. <laughs> well, and um, it, what's wonderful now is people are beginning to drop off, drop off the the the, the get together of the watering hole uh, as the time zone shifts. So the sun is now controlling us. <laughs> it's setting in South Africa, uh, I oh. think. It's 2 a.m. in the morning. It's um... <laughs> <laughs> and in in China, it's breakfast time. Uh... Yeah, uh, yeah, it's coffee time. <laughs> <laughs> so, Joy, do you want to make a final provocation? Um. Final, maybe uh, you can make the final, and I just uh, add a little comments. Uh, yeah, for my own uh, experience, I just sat at my home uh, in Beijing for around maybe eight months, just sit because uh, the complicated um, environment, uh, virus, and a lot of things. So uh, I think the thing I do is to find the, the Asian uh, wisdom from my own culture. I mean, uh, read some books on the very Asian, um, how to say, uh, um, uh, wisdom. So that's what I learned from the, um, the, the, the COVID-19. So we can also find our origin, cultural origin to inspire the, um, here in modern society. That's my thinking. Yeah. Okay. Super. Are there, I think we should do a last round of any comments or, or um, provocations, um, if that's all right. I think uh, we've been on it for two hours. I think we have an incredible two hours. And from my side, I um, thoroughly enjoyed the journey we've been on. Um, so I'm going to say thank you very much and keep quiet from here on out and let others make their provocations um, as we slowly going to start logging off. Um, we could do it in a slightly performative way. I saw Joel's got a guitar. I see Molly and, and Tuli are still there. I see Sylvia still there. I see all of you could be dancing and performing too. <laughs> we can all clap. We can all make sounds. So we could, we could leave in a kind of a more collaborative way. Um, and make our provocations in sound and movement. But you'll have to turn your microphones off, I mean on. <laughs> so unless anybody else wants to say something, I think that we should just express ourselves. Find something from your home, find something where you're sitting, in your office, wherever you are, bring it into the mix. And let's, let's jam for it. And action. Right.
I think we can use this opportunity to, for those that need to log off and move on with their day to just step back and go as the rest of us are still wrapping up our day. So thank you everyone for joining us. We'll be sending a link to the video of the documentation. And um, yeah, thank you to the post-pandemic provocateurs for setting it up. Yeah. <sighs>